Um, my name is Olale Kogumbemi. Um, I'll be the one taking you this class today. So what we've done today is Sunday, and um, we know quite a lot of people will be um, going to church this morning, and uh, um, a few people will be doing other things. So we like to keep Sunday short, Sunday morning short. So we'll spend about an hour or two looking at some high yield ophthalmology topics, and then we'll come back during our drill session to um, finish up. And so what we'll do is maximum two hours this morning. It will give you enough time to also assimilate and absorb because we will not be rushing. Um, the other thing is um, in the afternoon, we will not have much to do as well, maybe one or two hours. So it gives it a very nice balance. So rather than do our drills this weekend, because we, we've tried to put ophthalmology on Sunday and ENT, on Saturday um, and we want to finish it so we've used our drill period to do the spillovers. Ophthalmology may look very small but just like ENT, just like you've noticed yesterday, um, it is not a small topic. So I, I call them small but, but mighty and why I call them small is that you can actually cover the whole of ophthalmology in three hours if you are focused. If you are targeted on what you need to be studying, you notice that for my style, what I do is I do a two or three minutes talk before I start teaching. It's not because I want to teach you how to study. It's not because um, you don't know what to do, but but sometimes different um, subspecialties require different techniques. They require different systems of study. And it's always good if you use what we call the winning team. And so that's why sometimes I take some time out to, to advise. And of course, everyone has what is best for them. Everyone knows themselves better. So um, it's just an advice. You don't have to follow it. So this morning, we'll be looking at ophthalmology. And if you joined our ENT session yesterday, um, I told you we'll be using audio points this weekend. That's the style we've chosen to use for ophthalmology and ENT. What it does is it allows us to cover quite a lot, but at the same time, it, it allows you to concentrate on what the teacher is saying. So sometimes in the past, we've used um, teaching mocks with data in cardiology. Sometimes we've used what we call picture tests. When we're doing a charity course, we did a picture test where we showed you and we use that to teach um, 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 rashes in, in pediatrics. Now, ophthalmology has got a picture test, and that picture test is not part of section one, it's part of section two. So that picture test will be a drill. We'll show you a picture. We can show you an, a, a patient's eye with what we call strawberry hemangioma. My friends, you need to be able to do what we call point assessment you can't waste time so when you see strawberry hemangioma that is approaching the eye that is referral to pediatrics immediately that is you you need to ref, be referring that child you cannot treat that child in primary care once it's approaching the eyes so you see this picture and there will be just a few words there you need to make out what the question is all about and what the, so the question will be asking you what to do so first of all, you need to know the diagnosis. Second of all, you need to know that it's approaching the eyes. You can see that the question is a bit technical. For those who know it, it's simple. For the person that doesn't have an idea, they will struggle a bit before they finally find out what the question is all about. Two minutes has passed. You, can't, you don't have the luxury of two minutes in your exam, unfortunately. And so this is why we do a picture test separately. In the picture test, you see something that is very is looking whitish like a circle around the cornea they say the patient is 65. what's that so in in older patients they can have some sort of round ring around the the um, the cornea and it's that's because of age so cornea senilis is something that you can see in the elderly you don't need to do anything about that. You don't need to do much. It doesn't cause any problem. But what if this whitish opacification I'm talking about is on the lens? Then you need to be doing something. That's cataract, my friends. 
so in, in the AKT, they can they can you can see a small small lesion and that lesion is just close to the pupils it's, it's still far away from the pupil and it's gradually encroaching it's approaching the the pupil gradually that is a pterygion that is approaching the pupil well if it's not approaching the pupil you don't need to do anything about it a pterygion is usually not a problem it can cause a, a bit of discomfort grittiness sensation in the eye but once it starts to encroach the, the visual field area. Once it starts to go in towards the pupil, it wants to cover the, the point of vision, then you need to be doing something about it. So these are some of the pictures that you can see in your AKT. And you need to do what we call point diagnosis. You can't waste time. Now a patient that has xanthelesma, do you know how to, how to, how to pick it up in the AKT if they put a picture? Do you know how to manage dacrocystitis? Some inflammation of the tear gland there. You need to know how these patients present. Pictures in, in ophthalmology are, are a, a must. You must know them. But th those are the pictures I've just talked about are pictures of the external eye or pictures of the areas of the eye we can see. How about pictures of the retina? So if you look at, if you see a picture of central vein occlusion or central artery occlusion the the vein occlusion which we call tomato splash if you see a tomato splash in the akt would you recognize it well they can show you a picture of a patient who has just undergone surgery for what we call diabetic retinopathy what's that surgery the, the patient has had what we call pan photocoagulation you will see black black spots all over the, the, the retina area what's that F pan photocoagulation you need to know what that picture looks like if in case you see it in the exam so this is why we're going to do a ophthalmology or an ophthalmology picture test different a picture session different and it's high yield the reason why we're not doing it this morning is because it needs to be practiced certain things you don't just hear it you should practice it and that's why we've moved it to our session too there's no need deceiving yourself there are some things that you read even if you read it three times it doesn't stick you just need to practice it and that's why this course has been divided into such a way that certain things can be taught and certain things have to be practiced certain things will be taught and practiced so today we're just going to look at um, some very high yield topics and um, I will be doing audio points, what is referred to as running my mouth. And I just want you to focus on, because your notes are ready, your notes has all these things I'm saying in points. Your notes will come in as PDF document, easy to read. That's what we call easy learn, easy to read documents. But again, you will have a PDF slide. Your PDF slide has a picture, so as you are reading, but uh, you can see the picture of what you are reading by the side. So you've got everything in terms of material, and there's a time to, to do that. This time is to concentrate on the teaching. And so I've left the screen blank. You see the name of the topic, but we're just going to be doing audio points. Pick these points. The points in ophthalmology you need to pick are almost 200. 200 high yield audio points to be picked. And if you are able to pick at least 80% of the point, then you have done really well. Because it, it, it's, it's not, it will not be fair to yourself to get 8 over 10 if they bring out 10 questions in ophthalmology. That's not good enough. Because these are, these are areas to score easy points in the exam. When there are some people, they complain about statistics. They say, oh, statistics is too difficult. Well, if in statistics you get 6 over 10, then ophthalmology is the area to cover up. If you get 10 over 10 in ophthalmology, you get 6 over 10 in statistics, you are good. And if you are here in the class yesterday, I've told you that if you have been looking at the AKT trend, if you are someone that has, uh, has been scoring 7 over 10, 6 over 10 in different subspecialties in the AKT, that person is likely not to pass the AKT. Because at the end of the day, you will score something like 137 or just at 140. If you see the trend, the cutoff has usual, is usually above 140. People get the lowest cutoffs will be about 71, 72, and cutoffs have gotten up to 73. The exam 
Islam is becoming a bit more uh it, it, it's 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 a, a bit more realistic if you see what i'm saying it's something that you need to tackle headlong it's not a joke and the exam is not difficult it's not it's just that you need to be concentrating on the right things and so that's what we're going to be doing this morning my friends in ophthalmology we're going to be concentrating on the things that matter the things that matter the last cohort when we're doing ophthalmology we did just randomly we picked one topic after another and we're able to cover at least minimum of 70 topics in ophthalmology today we're going to do a different style i've divided um, the top ophthalmology topics based on whether they will cause things like tunnel vision or not tunnel vision or not that's because i want you to know about tunnel vision my friends well what are the causes of tunnel vision? Quite a lot of things can cause tunnel vision and it's always good for you to know them. So today's concentration is on causes of tunnel vision. At least this morning, I'll be going through some of the things that cause tunnel vision and I want us to know it at our fingertips. Then we can do others. Others will be causes, things that cause central vision loss. But whenever we're talking about tunnel vision, let me just, some, some people have been hearing the term tunnel vision, tunnel vision. What is tunnel vision? Well, if you see a, a chap or someone that has what we call peripheral visual loss, what does that mean? It, 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 what peripheral visual loss will do is to make it difficult or impossible to see objects that aren't directly in front of you. So, the patient will be able to see objects in front of them, but anything outside their direct view, they cannot see. That is their peripheral visual field. They can't see it. This is what we describe as tunnel vision or peripheral visual loss. So we're going to be looking at certain conditions which are high yields that will cause this. By the way, some of the causes of peripheral visual loss or tunnel vision will be things like glaucoma. And you wonder why um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm starting with glaucoma because glaucoma is super high yield. Please, when you ever, is, we are talking about peripheral visual loss, think papilloedema. Some people don't know papilloedema can cause um, tunnel vision. It can. Well, if you've seen a patient with optic neuritis, if you have been in this course, you've not heard me say optic neuritis, at least you must have heard me say it five times. Optic neuritis is high yield in your exam. Optic neuritis etambutol, optic neuritis multiple sclerosis, optic neuri neuritis cat scratch disease, optic neuritis syphilis, what we call tab tabis dosalis. Optic neuritis is everywhere. It is something that you cannot escape. And so we're going to talk about it this morning. Well, if you do see a patient with a stroke, some, some certain presentation will be tunnel vision, retinal detachment, tunnel vision. Cataract can cause tunnel vision. Retinitis pigmentosa, think tunnel vision. So tunnel vision is high yield in the exam. Well, later on today, we'll be looking at some other causes of central visual loss. And, and it's, it's something that I want you to know as, at your fingertips as well. We'll also be looking at some other things that don't have to do with the vision. For example, strabismus. You need to know what we call hypertropia and hypotropia. You need to know how it comes. You need to know what, what will be done for a child who is less than two years. My friends refer, don't be treating a, a child in, that is just six months, um, that is just one and a half years in surgery. There, there may be what, there's what we call lazy eye syndrome. You don't want to get into GMC problems. You don't want any complaints against you. So there are certain rules, just please follow them. So we'll look at strabismus, we'll play around with it. Please the cranial nurse, Okulomoto, we are going to look at it. Those, those things greet you in the exam. They say good morning. You need to greet them back by smiling. Say, I know what you want, and you give them what they want. If you see in the exam, lateral rectus, LR6, what do you, what, what's the question? What kind of question can come on it? Just one or two questions. You need to know how the question comes and the answer to the question, most importantly. So my friends, even the, tro the trochial and tro um, cranial nerve 4, you need to know how it comes. You need to know the kind of problems that it causes in the AKT. And so those are some of the things we'll be looking at in the afternoon. And um, I just want you to just follow gradually. It, it, it may look 
a bit rusty you've heard these things before nothing is new but as you are hearing them you just need some time to assimilate it and that's why we are doing audio points and that's why we've taken everything from the screen to avoid distraction again yesterday i concentrated and i tried to explain what dragons are i won't say too much about dragons but i think by today you already know what dragons are please exclude dragons from your notes please exclude dragons from your life when you say gathering of akt candidates and they are dealing with dragons dragon is high falutin stuff Jargon are things that you know that you don't see on a day-to-day -day basis. People are cramming it. Jargon is reading 600 pages of nice guideline that you will not remember in your exam. When you see people engaging in jargon, simply just say, hello guys, I'll see you guys later, walk away. When you go to a WhatsApp group and you see that the things they are discussing are not AKT related things, all you need to do is say okay i've got something important to do i'll catch you guys later please do not engage in jargons i beg you jargons is what wastes your time jargons is the commonest cause of akt failure some people um, can they say well i've read so hard i've read everything i don't know why i feel you fail because you were reading jargons you failed because you engaged with people you went to whatsapp groups that they were treating jargons AKT is not to impress anybody. AKT is simple knowledge. AKT is baseline. AKT are the things you need to know to become a good GP. And so, um, studying things that do not concern GPs. For example, Jargon will be studying things that are specialist related. For example, we are talking about cataract. What is your business with learning the procedure of fecal emulsification it is counterproductive why do you not have to know all the steps of small incision cataract surgery is useless to you you are not an ophthalmologist so why why don't you have why shouldn't you know um, when patients need a blue badge so there's certain there are certain there's something they call certificate of visual impairment what do you need to know that? You need to know that because as a GP, you will be the first person that will be contacted. Although you will not be the one to issue that certificate of visual impairment to a patient that is visually impaired, it will be the ophthalmologist who will examine the patient, determine that he's legally blind, and give him a certificate. That certificate is what they use to get reduced TV license. That certificate is what they use to get special parking spaces in public. That certificate is what they use for so many benefits. So this is why you need to know it because as a GP, you'll be the first line of action and you'll be the one to refer the patient to the ophthalmology. But knowing the nitty gritty of a particular surgery that is done in ophthalmology, like pan photocoagulation, knowing the steps, knowing the antibiotics to give after to avoid um, some, some very nasty infection is counterproductive. It's not your job. And this is why I call it jargons. So let's start today. Now that you know the causes of tunnel vision, you know what tunnel vision is. Let's look at one of the commonest causes of tunnel vision. My friends, glaucoma is high yield. By the way, let me just say that the commonest cause of blindness in the UK is not glaucoma. The commonest cause of blindness in the UK is macular degeneration. Have it at your fingertips. What of the commonest cause of blindness in the world is still not glaucoma? My friends, it is cataract. It is cataract. It, 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 it is very sad that they ask simple questions like that. Candidates fail it. They will put in your question, they will put glaucoma. They will put cataract. They will put macular degeneration. In fact, let me still say that the commonest cause of blindness in adults aged between 35 to 65, so what I'll call middle-aged or young adult, is still not glaucoma, my friends. It is diabetic retinopathy. So you can see that glaucoma has not got a place in commonest cause of blindness anywhere, whether in the world, whether in UK, or whether in a particular age group, it, it doesn't have a place anywhere. But glaucoma is high yield. What do I mean by it's high yield? It will be one of the questions that you will see in multiple AKTs in the same year. How can they be asking January AKT? They ask a question on glaucoma. April AKT, they ask a question on glaucoma. October AKT, they ask a question on glaucoma. And a particular candidate decides not to study glaucoma. That is self-harm. 
if you do not agree that everything I've been saying in previous times are self-harm, what will you now describe this as? You know that this will come out. You deliberately did not study it. What can you describe that as? So this is this is what we tell you in Easy Learn. If you know something will come out, you don't know the area of that topic that will come out, but you know that topic will come out. Know everything about that topic. Become good in that topic. Because that topic will also be used in real life. Then know about that topic. Now, you may be you, you may say I've not with, in our surgery we don't see eye condition. That's fine. Some surgeries, once it's an eye problem, they refer. Go and see optician. But my friends, you may receive a phone call as the duty doctor. Is this patient that has got severe headache, eye pain, the eye is red? You you've you've spoken to the patient over the phone because the first thing is they will phone your reception. And the reception will say, What do you want? The, the, the patient will explain, say, okay, let me quickly tell the doctor, let me hand you over to the doctor. The doctor that they handed that patient over to is you. You pick up the phone, you say, hello, how, how may I help you? The patient describes emergency signs of glaucoma. The patient is vomiting. The patient is very unwell. There is severe eye pain. That patient, what has, where is the patient? The patient has gone to the cinema. The patient was in a dark room. There has been precipitation of angle closure glaucoma. The patient is now very unwell. They phoned you. And the question is, what do you do? And all of you are smart enough to say, well, you need to phone the ambulance. And all of you are smart enough to say, well, you need to be in hospital. But the patient, before the patient goes, say, but this pain is too much. And I'm in severe discomfort. In the meantime, what can I do? This is AKT question. In the meantime, what can I do? This are real life. This is this is not a joke. This is not a film. This is not a teaching. It's real life. The patient will ask you, doctor, I'm in severe pain. What can I do now before the ambulance comes? The ambulance will take about five minutes to get here. This is where your knowledge comes. This is where you need to advise the patient. Right. Tell that patient, lie down on the floor, face the roof. Don't use a pillow wait for the ambulance can you see that even if you don't see glaucoma from day to day, from time to time you need to know everything about it you're knowing it for real life that's as a gp but you are knowing it for your exam as well so in regards to glaucoma what kind of questions can we see well i'll tell you that the first thing you need to know is that there's a disparity between what we call cop disc ratio normally the cop disc ratio in 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 a normal human being, in a patient without glaucoma, is supposed to be less than 0.5. Some areas will relegate it to 0.3. When it starts to get above that, when there's an increase in the... So what, what the thing is that, see the, the your, your cup discretion as a big plate and a small plate. The space between the big plate and the small plate, when put over each other, is the normal space that you are meant to have. And that's the ratio. Now, in a patient that has glaucoma, what happens is that the small plate in the center is beginning to increase in size over time. And that space is where the vessels come in and out. That space is meant to house the vessels. That's where all the, all the vessels, that's where all the nerves, everything entering into the eye, it enters through that space. Now, what happens is in glaucoma, the cup starts to increase, thereby reducing that cup disc ratio and it starts to cause pain it starts to cause a lot of problems in this patient you need to do what we call a tonometry what does it forget about the type of tonometry just know that you have to do a tonometry because that is jargons when you start to cram the types of tonometry but you don't you forget in the exam that you need to do tonometry because you've crammed it first of all keeps things simple you need a tonometry and what are you using a tonometry for to check intraocular pressure, to check intraocular pressure. Usually anything above 22, suspect glaucoma. It's not meant to be more than that. So when you are getting 27, 31, that patient is sus, sus, that patient will be in pain. That patient has glaucoma. Anyways, what you need to know about glaucoma is how they present. In the AKT, they put a lengthy question. Please, you are looking out just for a few things. First of all, in your question, you are looking out for midriasis. Midriasis is the precipitation of glaucoma. 
Midrasis is why they will have that pain in the first place. So in the question on examination, what would you see? Semi-dilated pupil is never fully dilated. Semi-dilated pupil equal glaucoma. Semi-dilated pupil equal glaucoma. What other clinchers will you see? The patient has been in a dark room. An example of a dark room in your exam is the cinema. So if you're expecting them to start saying, well, candidate B, the thing is that the patient has been in a dark room, you're wasting your time, my friends. They will say cinema. It's for you to know that in the cinema, and this is why in, as a GP, you have to be vast. It's not, it's not when they are talking about cinemas, you've never been to a cinema. It's not when they are talking about cinema, like, oh, I'm not interested in watching movies. No, you have to know it because your patients use it. Even if you are not interested in doing certain things, you need to know about them. You don't have to use cannabis to know about the side effects and the kind of problems caused by cannabis. You don't have to use uh, morphine to know the kind of problems a patient who uses morphine will have. You don't have to use steroids to know the kind of problems that you have to uh, actively engage and want to know these things because your patient will come in. And that's why I was taken aback at some point where they brought in a patient and they said she's been fine all her life, but all of a sudden she's having a manic episode. I wasn't sure of what, what was happening. For 10 minutes, I was asking questions up and down. By the time I decided to relax because I had no clue and I was going to refer the patient, I saw she was on steroids. My friends, you have to be good. You have to know the side effect of commonly used medications for in GP land, you need to be this good. So in glaucoma, you've got clinchers already. One of the clinchers you've got is semi-dilated pupil on examination. One of the clinchers you've got is midriasis. One of the clinchers you've got is that it happens in a dark room. One of the clinchers you've got is family history. One of the clinchers you've got is diabetes and hypertension. Those are risk factors, my friend. Poor lifestyle is a risk factor for glaucoma. Family history, think glaucoma. Well, if you, if we are talking about glaucoma, we do not talk about the types. Then we've not we've not started. So let's start glaucoma, my friends. There are two main types. Is either you are dealing with the angle closure glaucoma or you are dealing with the open angle glaucoma. If you are dealing with the angle closure glaucoma, that's usually the painful one. That's usually the one that causes a lot of distress to patient. That's usually the what I'll call the bad boy of glaucoma. And you need to know it. The, the, what, what happens is there's increased intraocular pressure. There's what we call a um, trabecular meshwork. And then there, there's the, the aqueous fluid is not flowing. Everything is trapped. And the patient starts to have pain from time to time. It starts gradually. It gets worse. Why are we concerned about glaucoma? Because it can cause blindness. Why are we concerned about glaucoma? Because it causes significant discomfort. It causes distress to your patient. And anything that causes distress to your patient, you are also concerned as well. Okay, let's, let me give you this patient. They say which of the following is associated with the patient above who has ankle, ankle closure glaucoma. They say A, they said it's got a meiosis. B, hypermetropia. C, myopia. D, um, red eye. And you are thinking, angle closure glaucoma, what, is, what do they mean by association? My friends, the acronym is CHOM. CHOM. CHOM means closure, um, angle glaucoma, angle closure glaucoma, hypermetropia. Open angle glaucoma, myopia. How do you fail it when you have simple acronyms to make your life easy in the exam? Chum, my friends. If it's closure, it is hypermetropia, long sightedness. If it's open, it is myopia. They are short sighted. That is the association. Chum. Do they ask this kind of question in the exam? It can greet you. It can be your question five. What if they make your question five? What will you tell RCGP? You tell them thank you. You tell them thank you because it's easy max. You tell them thank you because they were trying to help you. You tell them thank you because you it, it, it would have been a soft landing for a question before it that was a bit much more difficult to tackle. Maybe some sort of graph that was a bit complex and you had to take almost a minute and a half to figure it out. You say thank you because you spent 10 seconds on this kind of question. Chum. 
a candidate that fails it will be pained when his friends are telling him well and um, if you have this thing the thing is charm you remember that i've seen this question before so it was this easy it was charm you will be pained because the answers are very easy so now you know the association hypermetropia you know it's closed angle myopia you know it's open angle i don't think any of you should fail that in the exam it's not fair to yourself well i i give you this patient that has um um open angle um closure or open angle glaucoma and you are looking out for where is the patient ethnicity please for, for um open angle or even cl closed angle is very common in africans think that the, the person will be a black when you are seeing this thing think ssris my friend think steroids is a cause of glaucoma my friends think hypertension is a risk factor think diabetes will be in your question how do you feel these things when you know the risk factors by the way if you had seen african in your in your akt it can be related to ogtt it can be related to ogtt being an african is a risk factor african asian OGTT, please don't fail it in the exam. Whenever we're talking about gyne, we'll talk about it. Prostate, African risk factor. African male risk factor for prostate disease. Where else will you see African in the AKT? BMP. Although it's not a very direct relationship, but Africans may have falsely reduced BMP or even falsely increased BMP as the case may be. How is this related? think EGFR my friends Africans generally have a different EGFR from other people so we need to we need to actually recalculate our EGFR using a certain factor because our EGFR is not the same as the other ones that you just calculate straight so you can see that Africans ARBs my friends ARBs Africans do better with ARBs than AC inhibitors if I continue to go you will see Africans so many things Afro-Caribbeans, calcium channel blocker, first line, hypertension. The list is endless. This is hard to study, my friends. Whenever someone mentions Africa, tell them, I want to just tell you all the questions in the AKT that, that is related to Africa. You call 40 questions. The person looks at you. It's because you have these things at your fingertips. The person talks about kidney. You say, well, wait a minute. There are certain questions that will greet me in the AKT. There are 51 of them. Let me just sit you down and tell you everything. You go to eye pain. You say, wait a minute. Can I just tell you 50 courses of eye pain and their management? You go to leg problems. You say, can I discuss a few things about the leg? Things like plantar fasciitis. Things like Achilles tendinitis. By the way, Achilles tendinitis, you can't miss it in the exam. Don't miss the management, but don't miss the relationship with HLA B27. You will be pained. It is this. It is a friend with anterior uveitis. They, there's a there's a condition that puts all of them together, and you need to know these things. HLA B27 is high yield in the exam. There are certain A's you need to know. Apical fibrosis. Think HLA B27. Even in uh, in sarcoidosis. There's a link between HLA B27 and sarcoidosis. These are the, the they, are, they are known as the five A's. Well, that's not what we are doing today. When we get to rheumatology, I'll be telling you about a, a young guy who is 27 years old with back pain. He's got what? Ankylosing spondylitis. In ankylosing spondylitis, you need to know all the A's. The, the A associated with the lungs, that's the apical fibrosis. The A associated with the heart, you need to know it. The A associated with the eye, I've mentioned that one to you, is anterior uveitis. The A associated with the with the joint, actually tendinitis. How do you feel these things? How do you feel them? AV nodal defect, AV node problems is the A associated with the heart. Play around with these things, you can't miss them. These are when whenever we go to whenever we touch base in rheumatology and orthopedics you need to know everything about rheumatoid arthritis not just das 28 some candidates just know das 28 and that's all no you need to know the demands first line for rheumatoid arthritis 
when, when it's an acute attack, steroids, second line, one demand, and third line, add another demand. What are the demands? I'm talking about metotrexate. How come you know the name of the demand and you don't you don't know the monitoring? Left no no might. How do you monitor? When you see the TNF inhibitors, they ask a question about reactivation of TB, and you do not know that certain TNF in the inhibitors can reactivate TB, then you are you shouldn't go for that exam. How would the question come? Is a patient that has started a new medication is now having night sweat and fever? This is uh, easy. How about osteoarthritis? They will take you, they will drag you. You don't want to go there because you know it's too much. But when they drag you, you still smile. You just say, I'm, the only reason why I don't want to go there is because I know it's too much. That's what you should be telling the AKT. Because in osteoarthritis, you need to know the Oxford HIP score. In osteoarthritis, you need to know the X-ray findings. The acronym is LOSS. In, in rheumatoid arthritis, the X-ray finding is LESS. These are things you need to know. When you see bamboo-shaped spine, where is it? Where do you find bamboo-shaped spine? These are the findings in ankylosing spondylitis. They call them the four S's. Syndesmosis, you see the bamboo-shaped spine. You can't miss it out. So my friends, you need to be good. They drag you to men's health. You need to know everything about BPH, not just glycine score, not just IPSS. You need to know the full management of BPH. You, the question in the AKT about um, uh, BPH and prostate cancer will be on medication. How long do you have to wait for finasteride to work? It's six months, my friend. Another candidate will feel um, that, uh, that when you are giving the other medication, Tamsulosin, it's six weeks. You need to wait. So it's, look at how easy it is. Tamsulosin, six weeks. Finasteride, six months. How do you feel these things in the exam? They are supposed to be part of you. They are supposed to be known to you like you know your name. That's how easy these things are. So they can drag you dirty in prostate problems. You need to tell them, look, anywhere you take me to, I know it. What of infertility? They can drag you there. Tell them it is 3355 matos. What's that? How long do you have to wait to take a sperm to the lab? If you take it beyond that one hour or one to two hour, you, it, it will give you a wrong result. The man is saying, well, when do I take the sample? It's three to five days, my friend. How do you not know these things? My friend, they can drag you dirty to pediatrics. Tell them anywhere you drag me, if you drag my neck there, I'm going to show you that I know it. In pediatrics, they can ask you about GERD, gastroesophageal reflux disease. How do you not know uh, management of GERD in, 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 in pediatrics? It's a no-no. You have to know it. When it comes to a breastfeeding mother, Sometimes the management is different from when it comes to bottle feeding. What am I talking about? I'm talking about GERD. Again, in the AKT, please and please, they can drag you anywhere. Anywhere. Infectious disease, know everything about Zika virus. When we get to infectious disease, I'm going to teach you about hepatitis, how to recognize it. If you go, if you go to infectious disease and you do not know about HIV, then there is a problem, my friends. So they can drag you dirty. If they drag you to oncology, tell them I know everything. What do they want to ask you? Is it the commonest cancer in, in, in the UK or is it the commonest cancer in females? Is it the ones that are, uh, is it, is it the ones that cause pancytopenia? You need to know all the cancers, all the groups of cancers. We've sent them on the group. If you've not got it, we're going to send them again with their acronym. Cancers related to HMPCC. That's the, um, um, color, um, um, hereditary non polyposis colorectal cancer. You need to know them. Petroc, that's an acronym. You need to know Petroc. Cancers that are related to um, choriocarcinoma. You need to be slick, my friend. 10 seconds, you list everything out for me. Well, last week I, I took you people to cardiology. They can drag you dirty. What do you need to know in cardiology? You just need to know the simple things. Angina, heart failure. There's nothing big in cardiology. You just need to play around with them and know them. Well, let's go back to cardiology. I just thought I should challenge you this morning that whenever you are reading, reading is a little here, a little there. Don't spend one hour or two hours on one particular. Just move around. Know everything. Know something about everything. Because the exam is not only ophthalmology. The exam is everything. And this is why you have to know everything, my friends. So in glaucoma, they can ask you about the medications. And different people have got different acronyms. I will tell you about the different acronyms in our session too. 
but I'm just going to spell it out here. First of all, they can ask you um, what are based on the mechanism of action. You need to know that L and P have the same mechanism of action. One candidate once told me that her acronym is LTAP. I asked what's LTAP. LTAP for her was Lantanopros, Timolor, Acetazolamide, which is Dozolamide, and Pilocapine. So her acronym was the names of the actual medication. But your acronym can also be the name of the class of the medication. So whenever you hear of Lantanopros, it is a prostaglandin analog. Lantanopros think prostaglandin analog how does it work it increases uveoscleral um it increases uveoscleral flow in that lady's acronym the first and the last increases uveoscleral flow so in our l tap the l and the p increase uveoscleral flow what's the p the p is pilocapine is a meiotic agent is a meiotic agent so Lantanoprost and pilocapine, they increase uveoscleral flow. How do you feel it? Well, you've seen, you've seen a patient on Timolor and they're asking, how does it help? And what's the mechanism of action? How, in what way does it help the patient? My friend, it helps the patient by decreasing um, aqueous humor production. By the way, if you are here and you don't know the class of Timolor, please, the lab, when we're talking about cardiology, I say know everything about beta blockers. Beta blockers high yield in the exam. Propanolol used as off-label treatment for anxiety. Bisopolol is still the first line in AF. Bisopolol is still a treatment in heart failure. Bisopolol is still on the guideline for hypertension. Timolol is now on the guideline for glaucoma. How do you not spend some time, even if it's five minutes, reading beta blockers? By the way, beta blockers, they cause for a patient who is diabetic, they will reduce the awareness that's why a patient who is diabetic, sometimes when their blood sugar is less than three, they don't know. They are still okay. They still feel okay. Why? You've erroneously put them on beta blocker. Just two days ago, I saw a patient who had heart failure and hypertension, and he was already on beta blocker. Well, the doctor was, was tried to increase his beta blocker from 2.5, which he was doing well on, to 5, and he started to have bronchospasm. What that doctor forgot to do was to look at his past medical history. This, this chap has got asthma. Please, please, and please don't give Timolol to a patient with asthma. They will come down with bronchospasm. You are looking for trouble with the GMC. Why do you have to do that? Okay, you see this beautiful lady in the AKT? The lady, is, she's so stunning. You try to figure out why she's so beautiful. You find out that her eyelashes are long. You thought she had fixed it. You tell her, oh, nice eyelashes. She said, oh, I don't know. My eyelashes are so nice. And then they are even, they have got a distinct color. They are pigmented. It's because she's taking Lantanopros, my friends. All her friends are jealous of her eyelash. It's very long. It's very full. And it's a nice color. As if she has painted it she hasn't touched it lantanopros has done the job so if you are looking for nice eyelashes lantanopros how do you feel it in the exam when you know that lantanopros side effect is having nice eyelashes my friend okay in the exam they can ask you a few questions about acetazolamide or what we call dozolamide don't fail the question in the exam so acetazolamide or dozolamide is an um is an is a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor. That's how it works. That's the mechanism of action. Carbonic anhydrase inhibitor. And if they ask you about carbonic anhydrase inhibitor, it can come in any way. The commonest side effect of, of, of dozolamide is that it causes it. So the question will come in, a patient has taken a medication for glaucoma, and now they've got a very bad rash. That kind of rash you see in Steven Johnson's syndrome is really really bad what's that it is dozolamide causing what we call a sulfonamide like reaction dozolamide causes a sulfonamide like reaction that has what that's what is causing the rash in this patient forget that it's topical it can provoke that rash so this is how to study my friends pilocapine of course is a meiotic agent is going to cause meiosis 
So it's going to make the eyeball smaller. Where else do you see meiosis is anterior uveitis. This is how to study. If I were you, once I'm talking about um, um, pilocarpine causes meiosis, I will name 15 other causes of meiosis and how to manage them. This is how to study, my friend. So now this guy is causing meiosis. For it to cause meiosis, it will cause headache and blurry vision. So that's the side effect of um, pilocarpine. In the exam, they can ask a lengthy question. They will say he started a new medication for glaucoma. He's now having severe headaches and has gone back to the doctor. It's pilocarpine. They say he's now having blurry vision. It's the, on examination, meiosis found. It's pilocarpine, my friends. The patient has now broken, a, broken out in a rash. The answer is dosalamide. The patient is the patient collapsed. Please, we are talking about causes of collapse. I don't I don't know that you I don't I, I I'm not sure that you people know that an eye drop can cause a patient to collapse. If they ask you in the AKT that which of the following eye drops will cause a patient, it's timolol. How it causes heart block in a patient with heart block, you give timolol, the patient may collapse. So it's not just bronchospasms that you that you 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 are worried about. You are worried about heart block, and that is a cause of collapse in the AKT. So um, the only one I've not spoken about is brimonidine. I've left it out early because brimonidine has dual mechanism of action. I've told you L and P are together, T and A are together. You can form whatever acronym you like. L and P is lantamoprost pilocarpine. T and A is your timolol and your acetazolamide or dozolamide. And if I told you the T and A are together. They reduce aqueous humor production. While your L and P, which is your lantanopros and pilocarpine, they increase uvulosteral food flow. Brimonidine. Brimonidine is that medication that is used in rosacea. Look, look, at, look. If if they if they call the name of something and you your brain cannot identify everywhere in medicine that that thing is found everywhere in clinical practice that that thing is used you're not doing well you know why brimonidine comes out in the exam under rosacea just yesterday i mentioned to you about a patient who was given metronidazole gel for acne rosacea meanwhile the patient had rhinophima that patient needs oxytetracycline my friends dermatology can greet you in the exam you greet it back you don't have to you don't have to be g3 they show you pyogenic um, um pyogenic um pyogenic granuloma you know it they show you pyoderma gangrenosum you know it they show you keratoac and toma you say i know it they take you to pediatrics they show you milia you say i know this thing they show you stock bite you say i know this thing the one on the glabella you say i know this thing what we call angel kiss you say i'm, I'm sure i've seen this thing this is the answer they, they even want to they want to drag you dirty they show you a birthmark on the back mongolian blue spot you say i know it strawberry nervous this is the treatment you say is to refer for surgery but before surgery we can try some some uh, and type of beta blocker sometimes it works propanolol my friend they say this guy knows pediatric dermatology too much let's take him to let's take him to gyne dermatology they show you what we call melesma that is the mask of pregnancy how do you not know these things in the exam my friend they may say this guy is too good we know where we'll take him they take you to infectious and um, pediatric rashes in dermatology you know all of them measles mumps rubella before they even finish talking you've wrapped how which one is from which one is from face to neck to trunk which one starts from the trunk which one causes weeping which one is vesicular which one is which one has nagayama spots which one has complete smart they say okay stop stop there we know where we'll take you to now you are forming that you know okay let's take you to travel rashes they take you to things that has to do with malazizian 4-4 you know it. They take, they show you cradle cap before they finish showing you. Tell them the treatment. They they get tired. They say let's leave dermatology. Let's go back to ophthalmology. In ophthalmology, they want to ask you about brimonidine. You know it. Brimonidine has got dual mechanism of action, my friends. It it reduces aqueous humor production and increases you um um um, um uveosclera flow. You know it. But my friends, let me tell you how the AKT question will come. It's a question that has a red eye, and the red eye is the patient is on treatment for glaucoma. This is when they start to deceive you. This is where.
when some of the candidates start to get G3, they go and pick. Well, the like what the answer the question is what's the likely cause of his red eye? A patient on brumonidine for treatment of glaucoma. Some candidates will choose acute closure glaucoma. That's wrong. Some patient some candidates will choose open angle glaucoma. That's not correct. Some candidates will even choose that the, the, the patient has been rubbing his eye because of itchy. Give antihistamine. That's the wrong answer. Brimonidine is a cause of hyperemia. It causes red eye. Have, can you imagine a medication that causes red eye in a disease that causes red eye? Glaucoma causes red eye. Brimonidine will come and treat the red eye and after some time cause red eye. How do you feel this in the exam, my friends? You can't. I've elaborately described how it comes to you. How do you want to fail it? This is why I say sometimes you may want to fail a question in the AKT, but because you are in this course, we we'll make sure that you don't fail it. Even when you want to fail, we we'll say pass it first. When you leave this course, any other exam in future, you can go and fail that one, not this exam. We will drag you. We will make sure that you get the answer in the exam. And getting the answer in the exam sometimes is making sure you are not reading too much, but you are reading the most important things, my friend. So look at how glaucoma pharmacology has become very easy. Keep it this easy. Don't go and read two pages of glaucoma or three pages. It's counterproductive. Well, I've spent too much time on glaucoma, but I know why I spent the time. There are still a few things which we'll do in our session too. The only reason why I spent this time is because glaucoma will greet you in the AKT. How can you spend three or four hours reading xanthomas and xanthelesmas, which may not show up in your AKT, and you forget glaucoma? What are you doing? 